Barry, you're on. <laughs> yeah, no, this lady is a force of nature. Uh, I've had the privilege of knowing her since, uh, well, for a very long time. Um, she had guest hosted uh, on a TV talk show that I was production assistant on. And I remember the week that she was, <coughs> this was in Dallas. Uh, she, she, when she walked in, the energy in the room changed and she just uh, completely blew us all away and made such an impression on me. And then 15 years later, out of the blue, one of my clients uh, ended up uh, having a, a book launch party at her home in LA. So fate kind of brought us back together. One thing led to another and we decided to start working on a book. And 10 years later, there were lots of breaks in between uh, she, 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 uh, she likes to live her life and, uh, but we, we finally got the book written. She has been a part of Hollywood for over 50 years. She is, uh, she started off seven brides for seven brothers. She's worked with people like Clint Eastwood, Burt Reynolds, Charles Bronson, Johnny Carson, Fred Astaire, Robin Williams. Uh, she was friends with Rona Barrett, Debbie Reynolds, Lucille Ball, so many others. And uh, she's here tonight to talk about her autobiography, Consider Your Ass Kiss. And I think you guys will all just be blown, a bit, blown away by what she has to tell you. Barry, that was so lovely. It sounds like my obituary, for God's sake. Thank you. Thank you for that. And above all, thank you for the many, many years of loving friendship. Um, we have been pals a long time. And I have to tell you very honestly that there would not have been a book or my sitting down to do it if Barry hadn't said, I'll come out to California and sit and record everything that you say and, and we'll share the story. There's such good stories everywhere that you tell on the air and, and when you're visiting and, and doing interviews. And so I, uh, I said, by all means, come on out and spend the weekend. And we started recording. And of course, when you're recording me speaking, you're also recording dog barks, telephone calls, excuse me, I have to go to the bathroom now, you know, those kind of things all got recorded and all got transcribed. So when it came to editing, it wasn't just editing out stories that we didn't think would be as fun as other stories, but all the other stuff, but his patience and his stick to is a lesson for everybody in the public relations business at which he is the most accomplished young man I know. So that's my pitch for Darling Barry. And I'm so happy to be with this wonderful group of performers, of actors, of dancers, of singers, of musicians, of magicians. We're all showbiz trash. We're referred to that way so damned often that I kind of take it now as almost a compliment. And uh, I'm so happy to be with all of you, my darling, trashy showbiz friends. Thank you. Well, we're thrilled to have you. Thank you for coming, Rudely. Do you I, I'm Rudely? delighted. I, I'm sorry, I, I was gonna interrupt with just one thing and that is, it was so nice to hear Tootie talking about the veterans. This is a subject very near and dear to my heart. As you may or may not know, uh, Debbie Reynolds, who was my best friend and I miss her terribly, was one of the founding members of a group called the Thalians, T-H-A-L-I-A-N-S. And the Thalians are a group or were at the time, a group of young Hollywood show people who really got tired of being called pot smoking, hard drinking, sex minded asses that had nothing to contribute to society. And they said, you know, we hang out together and we sing around the piano and have drinks. Why don't we put something together, sell some tickets and raise some money for a good charity? And they sent out wonderful Jane Mansfield and uh, oh, Mamie Van Doren. Now you wanna talk about boobs, holy mackerel. They <laughs> cornered the bra size markets. Anyway, they came back to the next meeting 
saying, well, all the good diseases have been taken, all the big diseases. And so they discovered that there was a man, a psychiatrist working with emotionally disturbed children, which he described a, 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 an emotionally disturbed child as a rotting apple in a barrel and it can affect the entire barrel, hence the community and needed to be fixed. And so we took on emotionally disturbed children and 18 years later built our hospital, our clinic, the first to go in at the Cedar sinai complex. Um, and we took in everything from pediatric through geriatric patients. And it was fabulous and it worked beautifully. And then some almost 60 years later, we said, we're missing the boat on something. We are not taking care of those beautiful young men and women who are willing to put their lives on the line for America, no matter what corner of the world we send them to, no matter how much harm's way we put them into. And then they come back and sometimes they're forgotten or they slip through the cracks somehow, especially when it comes to mental health. And they come back wounded and maimed in many ways. So we Thalians decided to put our focus, our fundraising efforts, our show business talent, to helping our returning vets. And we joined up with UCLA's Operation MEND. Op MEND takes care of the broken and fractured bodies of these beautiful young people, the men and women. And we attempt to take care of the broken and fractured mind and spirit. And we've been doing it now for the about, oh, plus five, almost going on 10 years. And I'm very, very proud of what we have achieved all through the years. And it's kind of wonderful because, you know, mental health is something that is a closet disease. No family wants to talk about their family members who are emotionally unstable or have mental health issues. It's the hidden disease. It's the closet disease. Well, we Thalians are shining our clear Hollywood Klieg light, that spotlight, into that dark abyss that is known as mental illness. And we're shining that light of healing on them. And it is such a rewarding thing to have someone come up to me as they would with Debbie Reynolds before she left us and say, thank you. You have no idea what you've done for my family. You have no idea what you've done for my kid. You have no idea what you've done to help our entire community. And uh, that's kind of a, a blessing and a reward in itself. And I just want to say to Tootie, thank you for worrying about the veterans. Uh, you don't have to be one to care for them, but let's just everybody wake up to the fact that they do need help. And if anybody that's sitting around listening to us has a few extra dollars they want to send, whether they be $5 or 50 or 500,000, send it to the Thalians, T-H-A-L-I-A-N-S dot org, not dot com, but dot org. And uh, you can go to that channel and read about us and uh, what we do and how I, I for one, have put uh, 60 some odd years of my life into mental health of those who cannot help themselves. And uh, I've been so blessed. So I thank you all for being my Texas family and caring about me and having me visit with you today. Thank you, thank you. That's amazing. <laughs> yes, thank you for all you do too. You are okay. so welcome. I'd like to have a comment if I could. Brandon, acts of kindness are beautiful, but prolonged acts of kindness with a commitment and expansion are even more beautiful. God bless you. God. I have been blessed and I thank you so much for saying that. And I, I keep every once in a while, I'll, I'll say, God, I'm so tired. You know, we put on shows, we raised money by grabbing Hollywood talent and grabbing somebody that we asked, excuse me, I will get rid of that call. Can't talk now, call back. Uh, anyway, 
whether it was, you know, one of our honorees was, let's say, Frank Sinatra or Lucille Ball or Angela Lansbury or Whoopi Goldberg or Sally Fields, whoever the star was, they usually would accept and, and be our honoree. And then we built a show around that person. And we would get every star in town to come and do uh, some sort of a vignette or a, a you know cameo, uh, make an appearance, a singer, a dancer, or whatever. And everybody worked for free. Nobody got any money except the musicians' union. And and we did fabulous shows that uh, unfortunately we never really recorded because you had to get too many waivers to do that. And I'm sorry that that has happened, but what little bits of film clips that we do have went to the Academy of uh, Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And I guess they can be seen there if anybody really wants to. But uh, we raised millions and millions of dollars for mental health. And oh, I'd get tired and Debbie would get tired. We'd say, oh, Jesus, isn't there somebody younger to take over for us, you know? And uh, it was very hard to find anybody that would be foolish enough to take on the responsibility that we did. Uh, and it's very interesting. This is a rather generalized statement that I'm making when it comes to charitable works and volunteerism. Uh, the young generation that I'm dealing with now and trying to replace myself or anybody else in the organization is not as willing to come forward and break their back trying to help other people. I find that it's so hard to get through that phalanx of managers and agents and masseuses and, and uh, secretaries and coaches and whatever. And they're never too willing to, to commit their young stars to it. And then if you do get a commitment, it's like, well, they'll have to be flown in a private plane and, the, and their uh, band leader will have to come in with uh, certain pieces from the band and you will cover that expense. And there will be 12 people at a table. There goes ka-ching, 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 the money that we're trying to raise. Oh, and there will be a Rolex at the end of the deal, right? Well, that's not what most of us in show business of my generation, and thank God another couple after me, uh, grew up with. I don't know whether it came from vaudeville or what, but we felt if we were blessed enough to have a talent that we could sell and make a living doing this, then damn it, it was all up to us to do for those who couldn't do for themselves. And I'm so anxious for young people to either hear or read my voice saying, get off your ass and do something to help somebody else besides yourself. The rewards are marvelous. God smiles on everybody who does that. What, no applause? That's <laughs> well, most beautiful. of us are muted. You hit a lot of hearts, girl, because that's absolutely true. And the most beautiful thing anybody could do is do their part to make it a better world for everyone. Yes, God I agree. You. Thank you. Thank you. Barry, you know Ruta very well. Why don't you propose a couple of questions for all of us? And meanwhile, it sounds like I might be able to get some advice from you about that fundraising. By all means, I'd be happy to share any knowledge and experience I have with you. That would be fantastic. I did just start a nonprofit organization, and I don't want to bore everybody else here about it but um yeah i'm i'm looking at raising a, enough money to actually get commercials professionally made and get them aired to the general public and that's going to take a lot of money and i have a plan but i suspect you have a few words of advice that may be very helpful well, I'm not quite sure because you sure picked an odd time to start a charity. <laughs> Everybody, of course, is at home, so you'll get their attention if you can get some commercials made. And that's the whole point, is to get the word out 
uh, that you need out and it's very costly. Um, nobody works for nothing except actors and performers. And I, I admire us, those of us in any form of our business because we give our time and talent and it's the only thing we have to sell. And so I cannot help but feel that we are rewarded in the satisfaction in knowing that you've done something. But as it, when it comes to raising money, good grief, I've got a, a very good friend in the Texas area. Uh, he's sort of in Arlington area and he has a foundation that's called, um, oh dear, uh, Ranch Hand Rescue. And what he does is that he takes in all kinds of maimed and injured animals. And it's just amazing how rotten oh. cruel some people are to animals. And, and yeah. you know, I judge people by how they treat their animals and how they treat other people, you know, but yeah. animals especially. And he takes maimed animals that have been injured in some way and then has groups of young people who are troubled in some way or other, abused, mistreated children, and brings them in to play and be with the animals. And he says, it's amazing how those children will speak to an animal that's had its leg broken or it's been beaten or it's been whipped and, and starved much more readily than they will to a psychiatrist. And I, I support him so wonderfully. Bob, Bob Williams is his name and it's Ranch Hand Rescue. And uh, anybody that is interested in this, go speak to him. He knows how to kind of get things going. And of course it takes people paying attention to you and hearing your story. Once Americans are the most generous, loving people on the face of this earth. And I'm so proud to be one. And I've got to tell you that if you get the story out there, and of course it takes the help of the press and they're not as available as they used to be to us when we had a story to tell. But if you yeah. can just get your story out there, people will reach in to their pocketbooks, no matter how spare and bare they are. And, and help you because Americans are generous, good people. So I don't know quite what advice to give you, but when I come to Texas over a glass of wine, you can tell me all about it. Definitely, thank you very much. When are you coming to Texas? Oh, soon I hope, I miss Texas. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I still uh, claim residency there, uh, even though my house is now uh, rented because I haven't been using it enough. Uh, but you know, I, I played at Casa Manana for close to 50 years, for heaven's sake, my favorite theater in the country. Uh, although uh, the Paramount in Austin, uh, I did several times and I had a hell of a good time there. What a great town Austin is. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, but I'm, I'm anxious to get back home to Texas. I just love Texas. Above all, I love Texans because they don't defy you to entertain them, Texans. They come in and sit down in a theater and say, y'all, we're gonna have a good time. And they're <laughs> willing to go along with you and have a, a hell of a good time. And what a great spirit Texans have and share with everybody that comes into your wonderful state. Uh, well, it's less when you're not in it. Oh, you sweet person, you. <laughs> Consider your ass kiss, dear. <laughs> you won the uh, the Yellow Rose of Texas Award. Uh, yes. Would you tell us about that? Yes, yes, uh, from President Bush. And it was a, a great delight to, to be chosen. And it was one of the beautiful rewards that God sends your way if you are a do-gooder, you know? And I, of course, get to talk a little bit about what I do and what Debbie did and so on and so forth. But there are so many remarkable people in this world 
that do it just for the love of humanity or for the love of God, not expecting any reward. I get rewards. And one of them, of course, was being named the Yellow Rose of Texas. And uh, that to me is an honor that uh, I will cherish till the day I die and then some. I'll take that lovely, lovely award with me to meet God and say, will you let me in, please? Look what I got. <laughs> nice. Ruta, you, uh, the Casa Manana Theater, something that obviously ties you very much to Texas. Could you tell us how you started your career there? Your At Casa Manana? Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, most of you may not know, but I had a very unusual experience and adventure in bringing my grandmother out of Siberia into Lithuania, where she was from. My, my grandmother and grandfather, who didn't have a pot to pee in, they were poor farm folk, scrappy little farm that they had. Uh, my, my mother used to have to carry her shoes to church on Sundays because the next daughter had to get those shoes. So she put them on when she entered the sanctuary, you know, for mass. But uh, I mean, they had nothing and yet they were shipped off to Siberia. And I assume that it was because the communists were trying to repatriate Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, all those Eastern, Eastern European countries with, with Russians. And uh, my grandfather, died en route to Siberia on that cattle car that they were being deported on, just like the Jews experienced, you know, when they were going through the deportations. And um, it, it, when, when they took, his legs were frozen, and when they took his boots off, the flesh came off with it. You know, the gangrene had set in and he died, but my grandmother sent on, she never even knew that. Anyway, long story short, many, many years of trying to get her out, and uh, we, we found her, my mother found her after World War II in Siberia. I uh, did the unusual kind of thing. And they say, when you're desperate, you should do almost anything. Don't take no for an answer. And I picked up the phone and called Khrushchev. And I placed a call to Nikita Khrushchev, the Kremlin, Moscow, USSR. And that bitch operator, the American said, how do you spell Khrushchev? Well, who the hell knew where the huck and the seas of the things were? Anyway, long story short, I, I got through to his interpreter and within 48 hours, I was on a plane with my mother and father who had not been back to Lithuania since they left some 35 years earlier. And we located my grandmother and I was eventually allowed to bring her home to the United States. Six months later, I went back to get her. Well, all of this had been followed worldwide. We made the front pages of every newspaper in the country, not just our country, but every country in the world, including China, not in the Soviet Union, however. However, I was very well treated. And when I got back, a lovely man that was then the director, Mike Pollock, at Casa Manana had been following this like the perils of Pauline. And he came to New York when he heard I'd be there, my agent said I'd be there, and came to see me and talk me into being Molly Brown. He said, any girl that can fight the Soviet authorities and get their grandmother to come to America has to be Molly Brown in person. And he talked me into it. The money was terrible. I mean, I, I think it was like $700 a week or something, which, uh, you know, when you stop and think about it, isn't so bad. But it wasn't the kind of money that I was used to making in television and, and movies and whatnot here in town. But he really had a persuasive quality about him. He said, come, Ruta. You will not regret it. Well, I've got to tell you, I bless Mike Pollock every day of my life. 
he gave me the greatest gift of all. And that is the friendship that I found, not just on stage, but personally, not just in Molly Brown, but personally. And I, I think it's the greatest gift I've ever been given, the loving open arms and hospitality of Texas and its people. And I have to thank Mike Pollock for that. I also have to thank the audiences that filled the theater every night. You know, you've got a 2000 seat house that was more fun. And of course, year after year after year, I came back home to, uh, to beautiful, beautiful Fort Worth and Casa Manana, my favorite theater in the country. So I owe Texas a lot. I also owe Texas thank you for my husband, who was then the, the president of Bonanzas, you know, the steakhouses across the country and was from Dallas. And I met him on a plane, thank you, American Airlines. And uh, so I had a 46 year blessing of a marriage and I owe it all to Texas because I met him on a plane heading to Dallas Fort Worth and so I'm, I'm grateful to God Almighty for sending him in my direction and for sending me in the direction of Texas and I thank God and I thank y'all for being my friends. Yeah. Uh, is that Sammy in the background? That's Sammy screaming and I don't know where Ona is but <laughs> I should bring him in, the little bastard. <laughs> Runa has this big, beautiful, white... Uh, cockatoo. Cockatoo, yes. And uh, who's going to outlive us all. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that sits by the pool throughout the day and then comes in, at, comes in at night. Ruta, I always tell people, you live in what seems to be, or seemed to me in the beginning, to be this like big four-story white, this ivory castle in the hills to know you is to know the house, like you and the house kind of go together. It's a lot of history. How many years have you lived in the house? Well, I basically grew up in this house. When we moved to California, my family were very, very conscious of properties and so on and so forth. And they always owned. And this is something I like to pass on to young people all the time. They taught me the value of real estate. And the whole point is buy something, not just for you, but that has other setups that you could rent and let your renters pay the mortgage. And that to me is something that I really like to pass on to everybody. And that is save your money and buy property. It never goes sour on you. You know, it really works better than stocks, bonds or anything else. Um, but this house they bought at, they bought it, you know, very frankly, between us, $65,000. But that was in 1948, when $65,000 was a hell of a lot of money. And they had to use that to, you know, they had to make a mortgage and pay it off and all of that good stuff. Well, now, that piece of property, of course, we're talking a lot of years later. Uh, I wouldn't think of selling it for under, what, 15 million? So you see, I really am a believer in real estate. And I have some in Texas, and I'm hanging on to it. I have some in Mexico, I'm hanging on to it. And I advise every young person, save your monies and buy a piece of property and either rent a room, rent an apartment, rent something in it to help you pay the rent. Nice, nice. Uh, Ruta's got Judy Diamond, who is with us tonight. That's her longtime she's assistant for 10 years, right, Judy? Pain in the ass is what, pain in the ass is what she usually calls me, but yeah, it's well deserved. Right yes. there in the trenches with us. We were like the three blind mice, three amigos, all of those things, uh, putting the book together. So we took that journey journey uh, together. There's a wonderful picture of us, small, but nevertheless, very meaningful, working 
and uh, in not very glamorous surroundings, surrounded by all kinds of papers and, and documents and files and whatnot. And uh, I express my thanks to the two people that made this thing happen. Without them, it never would have happened. I, I really respect writers who will sit down and do this day after day after day and make a living at it. I find it to be a very painful experience. But Barry, you help that a lot by doing by recording it and then having the recordings transcribed. If I had to sit and type away uh, at a computer, I, I would never get anything done. We, we had a lot of moments along the way in those 10 years when we would be sitting there together, the three of us, you know, wondering, well, if this ever sees the light of day or is it whatever <laughs> it is. So I just always thought you really have to be in love with the journey. And regardless if the book got published or not, you're gaining a lot from the journey. Obviously, we wanted to have something to show for our efforts, and it did happen, but, you know, you there was just so much that, that we gained from the process along the way, you know, so. I'll tell you what I have learned besides the joy of sharing and getting something, getting the turkey on the table, is the experiences that I've had at the book signings, I am so humbled by the respect and regard and the love shown by people who have stood in line for an hour or two hours in 105 degrees of heat in, in sunny Palm Springs or in cold and somewhat blustery Fort Worth just recently to get a signature and to say hello. I, I'm so grateful that I have these kinds of wonderful friends that are willing to wait and express their love by buying my book and then waiting to have it signed. I have another book signing coming up uh, this week, in fact, in, uh, in Palm Springs, and it's for multiple sclerosis. It's a fundraiser. And I, I'm so delighted that people come and, and do this. And, you know, I just am so grateful to God and to, I guess, my parents for not stinting when it came to give her some lessons if she needs them so that she can get out and, and sell her craft and, and that people came to buy it now that they're buying my book. Wow. So I, I advise all of you, of course, I say go to your local bookstore because everybody needs the business so badly in this COVID crap. Um, that, uh, but they'll have to order it because they won't have it on in stock. In fact, I think it has to be ordered everywhere. But Barnes and Noble carries the book, or will order it for you, and certainly Amazon.com has it, and it's readily available. And uh, what I love about it, Barry is that we tried very hard, it seems to me, all of us, uh, but especially me in this case, that what I said got translated into black and white print in my voice. I hear this from almost everybody that has read the book, that it was like sitting down and having a drink with you and schmoozing and, and hearing the stories. And that was what you always said worked so well and would work well in print. And you were right. Yeah, yeah. And you're going to have an audio version, right? Yes, I'm going to do that in February. And I'm really looking forward to it. I'm so delighted because I had visions of, you know, the publishers or the, the people that are doing the audio book saying, no, let's get somebody else to do you. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny Graves, he had a uh, Kenny Graves. He's a radio host. You've interviewed he, you yes. had interviewed with him before. He wanted to know about uh, you got prime real estate with your star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. But there's a I sure did uh, when you were working at the theater as a teenager. So could you tell us the story? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I write about this in the book a little better than I'm telling it, but. Uh, 
when I was going to, I finally got out of Catholic school because I had been raised, you know, in, in uh, schools, church schools. And uh, the nuns beat the hell out of me, but they also beat a lot of sense into me. And I swear that's the only knowledge I ever really gained. But I finally got out and got to go to Hollywood High. Why? Because they had a bus and I didn't have to drive to school and wait for my father every night, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, at, while I was at Hollywood High in the summers, I would go get a job in different theaters. And I finally advanced up to Grauman's Chinese Theater. And this was the creme de la creme. And I was so happy in my little red tunic with the black pants and a flashlight standing at the top of the aisle to show people to their seats. Now, most of our guests won't even know what the hell I'm talking about. An usherette, who's seen an usher in a theater in these days, except live theater. So I thought it was great because I could stand there and watch, you know, all the, the fabulous stars, Betty Grable and June Haver and Mitzi Gaynor, and all of them, amazingly enough, became my friends. Wow, what a blessing that is. Anyhow, this was all fine and good, and I just loved it because I could just stand at the top of the aisle and watch those queens, those screen queens. And then one day I got promoted to Candy Girl. Now, I've got to tell you that math has never been my long suit. I failed math twice in grade school. Anyhow, I could handle this because everything was 10 cents, 15 cents, 25 cents. I could deal in those numbers. And I did quite well there and I was fine and it was right next to the top aisle. So if I wasn't selling candy, I could go watch the movies. Then one day the cashier in the box office got sick at famous Grumman's Chinese Theater. And I got promoted to cashier and I said, I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. And they said, don't worry about it. Look, you, buy, you sell two tickets, you punch in two at a dollar 98. And then if they give you $5, you punch in $5 and it gives you the right change. And I panicked, but I said, okay, okay, okay. And I did it. And we were $40 short that night. And I got fired. And in tears, I said, you don't know, I didn't steal that money. You should have had somebody else come in. I couldn't do that. I'll be back someday in the fan and footprints. Wait and see, wait and see. Well, yeah. my guardian angels, serendipity, all went to work. And where did I get my star on the famous Hollywood Walk of Fame? But right smack in front of the bloody box office. Da -da <laughs> now, is that comeuppance or what? That's beautiful. Very nice. Um, um, a couple of quick things. The gentleman in the white with the glasses, whose name is appearing to be iPhone. Would you please fix that so we actually know your name? Maybe he doesn't. And I see only one person with a raised hand. I, I believe Gary he has a question, doesn't he? Yes, and I, I know that there are probably more people with questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Tootie, Tootie asked in the chat, would the people with questions please raise their hands? And you do that by clicking on the screen. Oh, yes, I see. How do they do that? How do they raise their hands? Like this. <laughs> No. Well, I unfortunately am only seeing Barry when he's on and Judy. I see nobody else. There's nobody on the screen except it says this meeting is recorded by the host or a participant and a whole bunch of crap I can't read without my glasses. Does she, does she have anything? Do you have anything that says view in the upper right hand corner? View? No. Oh, it it okay. actually is okay. It What I need is from the people in the audience, you, if you have questions, the way that the host can know and then call on you. I'm seeing a pretty lady with dark hair now with a microphone in her and gold beads around her neck and a sleeveless dress. That's yeah, Judith that is, that is I. I'm Judith. I oh, need Judith. Something. So we have two Judys. Okay. Yes. The people in the audience, 
please use the feature on Zoom whereby you can have a raised hand. And Gary, you've got yours raised. Maybe you can tell them how they can raise their hands. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I can how actually can tell you. Other, how yeah, can the other people raise their hands, uh, Gary? Down at the bottom, it says pause, stop, recording, and, and to the right of that, it says reactions. You click on that, and you can see a thumb up. It's got several different icons. Oh, I see. So that's how the you reactions. Click on I reactions. Don't have that, Gary, I don't have that at all. I well, you Jeff, don't need did to. You, did you raise your hand up there? If you guys are on your cell phone, you can go to the three dots on the far bottom right and it says more and it'll show chat meeting settings minimize meeting background filters and then it has a little sign that says raise hand gosh i wish i could see you i see pretty people oh. uh, ruta look in yes. the mirror ruta thank you is that gary that i'm talking to now yes ruta and you only see people enlarged when they're talking so okay it goes back and forth I grew okay. up in Fort Worth, Texas, North Richland Hills. Oh. And I uh, went to Casa Mignana a couple of times in my late, uh, in the late 60s. Might have even seen you there sometimes. But uh, uh, have you ever thought about playing Ann Richards? No, but what a great idea. You just remind me of it because of your vibrancy and so forth. And oh, I'm, what a lovely thing to say. Thank you. Well, why don't, we, why don't we get somebody to write something and get Anne to agree? There you go. Maybe she'd come and visit with us. Well, her she's passed, she's passed away. Her daughter. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> she can still come and visit with us. There you go. I will be Anne. Thank you for your enthusiasm and for what you do for other people. God bless you, sweetheart. I have been blessed, and thank you for saying that, Gary. I appreciate it. Can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Hi. Okay, hi. Yes, okay. we I, need to know your name. Huge. I, I'm not familiar with this. I try to sit up on my TV, and I need directions on my – I need to get my aunt out there to help me with this because I'm not familiar. I need to switch from Grande to another service on my, on my TV anyway. So I'm like, I just okay, got off. Hang on there, hang on. Okay. What is your name? Uh, Danny Weiner. Okay. Hi, Danny. And I think we have somebody who had their hand raised. So if you would, if apparently you don't know how to raise, I know. <laughs> but I think we had someone who already had it raised another way, TJ Finn. So how about you ask your question after TJ does? Is that okay? Danny yeah, Weiner? I just, yeah, I mean, I raised my hand. I mean, I just, just to do it so I just show I'm, I'm out there because I didn't know my phone. A phone acted like it, it wasn't, nobody was allowed to, to see me. I don't know what to deal with it is. You, you'll be right after TJ. Go ahead, TJ. I was going to say, no, let, let Danny go ahead. It's fine. I don't mind waiting at all. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Those polite Texans. Let's not to... argue. Somebody talk. TJ. Hi. Oh, it's such an honor, Rhoda Lee, to meet you. Um, I'm just, uh, uh, you're, first of all, you're stunningly beautiful. Oh my God, thank you. What pretty hair you have, my darling. Thank you for oh, sharing. Thank you. This is me going gray. I have embraced my gray. <laughs> me too, darling, me too. I've embraced it with a little Clairol. Right, <laughs> that's what I need. That's what, everybody always says, oh, your hair's so pretty blonde. It's not, it's gray, but that's okay. <laughs> We'll go with that <laughs> um you know uh i know your your career spans back to from what i understand the 1950s i remember you from um seven brides for seven brothers one of my favorite films of all time my first movie job wonderful it was just it was, i'm just curious because you played on i mean everything from twilight zone to perry mason to just it's overwhelming wow um what and and i'm somebody may have asked this i came in a little, little late i was chasing a four-year-old so and it wore me down <laughs> but um what of all of everything you've done television wise and movie wise what's been your favorite role wow well of course i have to say that my very favorite will always be seven brides because it was such an auspicious 
fabulous beginning for a career. And remember that in those days, in the 50s, when this was 54, uh, we worked six day weeks. They uh, six six days, you know, a week, not not the fives we have now. And just the rehearsals alone for the dances were at least six weeks. So it was it was a strenuous, wonderful job. When it comes to television, there have been so many things that I love doing. But one of my favorites, you mentioned Twilight Zone. Uh, I, I, an episode called A Short Drink from a Certain Fountain, and I loved it because I got to play a real testy little bitch. And bitches are so much more fun to play than the good girls, you know that. I love uh, it. I also did a, a wonderful role that stood out very well on a Bonanza, mm. which struck me very funny that there I was on Bonanza, and then I meet the love of my life who is the president of the real bonanzas, you know. Oh, yes. And so that that was sort of tied together beautifully. Uh, the most fun I ever had in my life was, of course, being leading lady to Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis, Peter Lawford, Joey Bishop, the Crosby Boys, uh, Sonny. Oh, I, it was just a, a great, hysterically wonderful, fun experience for me. And uh, doing witness for the prosecution with people like Ty Power and, and uh, Marlena Dietrich and the wonderful Charles Lawton and Elsa Lanchester was an amazing experience. But you know, you think that they're all going to be there forever. Mm. I, I used to get wonderful notes from whoops, did, did, are we lost? I oh. used to get Wonderful notes from uh, our, my, my wonderful friend, Fred Astaire, that I did funny uh, face with. And uh, did I keep them? No, because I thought they'd always be there. And uh, boy, that's something that I advise young people to do. And that is cherish those things that may go down in history if you become anything of a known entity and uh, and sell tickets to things. Um, do save those things that help you along the way. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. You know, I wondered, I, you know, when I was looking through, I was like, how would she ever know which one was her favorite? She's done so much. So many. I've done over 2,500 television guest appearances, you know, and uh, I did a, a series for a little while that was great fun, but this, the our, spot, our studio was CBS and they were just so tight assed is all I can say about what they could say, what they could do. And I said, do these people not take a look at the Golden Girls and what's being done and said and shown you know, on Golden Girls? And uh, it, it was a fun series because it was about a retirement home and mm -hmm. uh, not home, but a retirement village with beautiful surroundings and everything else. And it was a fun part for me because you had to be of a certain age to be there. And I was younger than that, but I kept marrying older men. So they referred <laughs> to me as Black Widow. And I just loved it. I loved the part and, and uh, doing the show, but I'm sorry that it didn't last forever and ever. Well, Danny, we I think you're up now. Oh yeah, maybe there's one question I probably should say. And that is, I'm going to slowly get back into acting, uh, despite um, I, I, I'm a cancer survivor. I'm, re I'm in remission. Well, I hope I am. I was supposed to see my oncologist early this month, and um, he keeps putting it back. And I'm now seeing him on the 24th. I, have, I did my blood work, CAT scan, and uh, I'm sure it's okay. Hmm? Keep working. It'll help you stay well. Yeah, yeah. I, I just hope that I, there's a little bit of chemotherapy. <laughs> I had took like light chemotherapy. It ended two years ago just two years ago on the 22nd. Hopefully that doesn't affect my, my speech or anything. I'm sure it won't. I'm just, you know, that's just, good you know. You. Go find yourself a good part and throw yourself into it and forget your illness. Just take the medications you're supposed to, take care of yourself, but hard work will see you through any kind of crap that you're living through. Yeah, my, my agent says, my agent's gonna take me back. He just said, when to make sure I'm 100%, you know, there, I mean, ready. So, you know, 
but I'm well, even even if you work as a volunteer in little theater, just yeah. do it. Keep yourself yeah. busy so that you're not thinking about, oh, what's my next step? You know? Yeah, I, 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 step a dance step for the show. And that's yeah. I guess my question to you is: is did you know of any cancer survivors that, that had to go through treatments while acting? How did how did it affect their speech or anything? Or you know? I've I've known lots of cancer survivors who kept working. And I still do. And uh, no, their speech was not, not affected. Their their energy was affected. Yeah, affected. Yes. You know that that can affect you a little bit. But it's just amazing how you keep taking some of that B twelve liquid and and it sees you through. You know, just yeah. help yourself. So, yeah. God bless you, and uh, we'll we'll think of you in our prayers, my dear friend. Thank you. And Who's next that? up, we have Bonnie. Yeah, sending prayers to you, Danny. Um, Thank you. It is such a pleasure to meet you, Ruta. Um, I actually, my question was about the Rat Pack. What was it like to perform with Frank Sinatra? And then, whether you ever starstruck by anyone? Uh, yes, I'm still starstruck by people, you know. And of course, I was starstruck by Mr. Lawton, you know, and. Uh, but but when you meet them, you know you don't stand there going. Uh, but but, but it, it it it's really kind of special. And uh, when I first met Lucille Ball, I was just beginning in the business, and and that was kind of overwhelming. And I, I got to sit with she and and with uh, you don't sit with she. I sat with her. My English is getting bad. Uh, I sit with her and and Desi. Uh, in their box at the Del Mar racetrack, huff, huff. It was, it was really great. By the way, bitch, look at your gorgeous hair. Speaking of- <laughs> Thank you. Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna have to write that down. Ruta Lee said, by the way, bitch. <laughs> it's gorgeous and you're such a pretty girl. Uh, well, obviously you. you're- She sings great too. I was gonna say you're in the music end of our business, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, I mean, yes. Those guitars aren't just trim. They're, they're there <laughs> for you. Well, maybe we'll work together sometime. I did Best Little Whorehouse in, uh, in Austin <laughs> and, and had great fun. Uh, but your question was, how was it working with Frank? It was fabulous. I mean, I had never met him. And he hired me because of the film that I talked about, Witness for the Prosecution. And he didn't know that I got witness for the prosecution because of him, because I went to see Frank Sinatra at the Macombo. And this was uh, the very late 50s, early 60s. And the Macombo was one of the joints in, in Hollywood that was suffering terribly, a nightclub, a very famous nightclub. But all nightclubs were suffering terribly because television had taken over and everybody was staying at home and not going out to restaurants or to clubs. And um, the owner had prevailed upon Frank to come in and play a week and then maybe Victor Moan would play a week and Frank and uh, Dean Martin would play a week, get the business rolling. And so I went to see Frank Sinatra and I was invited by a, a very dear friend and there were like 12 of us and Frank was work, his orchestra filled the entire nightclub stage. You know, they're very small nightclub <laughs> stage. And he was working on a small dais in front of the, the orchestra. And a note came from a gentleman that was seated almost behind Frank Sinatra because of where he was. And it said to the, my host, would, would uh, you bring Miss Lee to my table? I'd like to meet her. And I went back to meet him and he said, hello, my name is Arthur Hornblow Jr. This is my wife. And I have just given you a very unique screen test. I watched you watch Frank Sinatra and look, I don't know if you're aware of this because you're so young, but there has never been, nor will there ever be anybody on stage as mesmerizing as Frank Sinatra. So needless to say, I sat there with my mouth hanging open, you know, during the whole performance. And he said, I've just given you this screen test. I watch you watch Frank. And I think you would make a very good love interest 
for Tyrone Power in a movie that I'm doing called Witness for the Prosecution. Oh my would you, God. Would you come in and meet Billy Wilder, the director? And I said, it's tomorrow too soon. And I went <laughs> in the next day and they put me on film. And this blonde hair that I'm proud of now, like yours, uh, immediately became brunette that night because Marlena Dietrich took one look at the rushes and said, Nicked, forget it. She's blunt like I am. So that's how I got witness for the prosecution. And Frank liked nothing more than to have friends over for dinner, a big Italian dinner, and then let's watch a current movie. And what did he run one night but witness for the prosecution? And he said to his partner that I'd worked for many times, Howard Koch, you know, I've been watching this Ruta Lee chick. Uh, I think she'd be good in one of our upcoming movies. What can we put her in? And that's how I got to be the leading lady in Sergeants 3. Now, oh. talk about serendipity working. Think about that with my, my star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in front of where I got fired from. And then... Again, a matter of luck or guardian angels or the almighty aiming for me. So good luck with your career, my dear girl. Thank you so much. And I have one question. I have a podcast that I started and it's basically, it's only two months, three months old, um, but it's just, in, I'm interviewing people that are doing what they love. And I would love to share your story, if that's at all, at all possible. And I can get with Barry if I need to. Sure. Um, but I love, you're just, your voice, you're just, your presence. It's just so, you know, just like Barry said earlier, just makes people come alive. And I, I just, I love it. You're so well, inspiring. Thank you. Well, that is so kind. I mean, I thought, what am I going to talk about? Well, I guess there's plenty to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't mind sharing, but thank you for the sweet words. And yes, I'd be happy to do your podcast and we'll share this with everybody that cares about you and your music. And thank you for being my friend. Thank you so much. Wow, that was lovely. Uh, next up is someone I have not seen in way too long. But first, I just wanna remind people, raise your hand if you have a question but please unraise it if you are done with your question. Kenny Peters, you're on. How are you? Can you hear me? Yes. Ah. Awesome, awesome. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's nice to see everybody here for sure. Um, and it's a pleasure to meet you, Ruta. I grew up in Mesquite and I remember oh. seeing your commercials for the Casamagnana on KTVT. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. What do you so, mean commercials? You didn't come to see me, you silly bastard? Um, sure, yes, I did, actually. <laughs> but I was a young one. I was a little kid. Uh, That's good. But it was, it was great to, uh, to see you coming onto this, and I was really excited. But I loved the discussion that we were having at the beginning. I missed the first maybe five minutes of the meeting talking about mental health. And I am somebody who has dealt with that uh, issue myself. I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder oh. 14 years ago, and I'm in great shape i mean i haven't had an episode in six years and so oh bless you oh. you know it's it's taken a lot of work to get there and a lot of uh knowledge and a lot of education and i'm fine with that i went back to school a few years ago and i graduated with my bachelor's in audio production last year oh. so and i'm also an actor so it's kind of like i'm really involved with the industry um but one of the things i wanted to ask you was do you see the same kind of stigma uh, like I've got, a, I've got a friend that I do her social media. She's in her mid fifties and I've been doing her social media for about six years or so. And she definitely has noticed the drop off in roles for those that are 50 above and above, especially oh. women. And she's, you know, and so she's kind of doing her own thing still. Um, and I keep telling her, you know, just keep going, keep going. That will be the perfect role. But do you find, or that the stigma that's associated with the term mental illness, because so many people just shut off immediately when you hear that term or when they hear that term, do you find that same kind of stigma associated with people who have been open about mental illness as the non roles for, or not very many roles for actors or female actors over 50? Do you find the same kind of thing out there or is it well, getting I, better? I would say that it's getting better. And I think, especially within our industry, 
that they're more open to this. And it's very interesting that you talked about being diagnosed about 14 years ago. The sad part of all of this is that my best friend, Debbie Reynolds, who spent her entire life, you know, and she pulled me in, dealing with raising funds for mental health problems, for research and, and uh, treatment. Her daughter, of course, was diagnosed after many, many years as yeah. bipolar. Right. And I stop and think of how many shock treatments and other treatments and things that that girl went through yeah. before they even had a name for it, before bipolar became such a known fact of life. Right. And I'm, I'm grateful that we are talking about it. I'm grateful when stars come forward and say they've had problems, whether they be problems with drugs or drink or whether they're mental issues of a different nature, when they talk about them, it shines that spotlight on it that makes people who are nervous about it come forward and say, well, what the hell? I, you know, if they can do it, I can do it. And, and I, I cannot help but think that we're helping people survive the stigma is not what it used to be. Uh, but it must be a very difficult thing to live with because I know what Debbie went through with Carrie. And of course she eventually died because again, there was a problem that wasn't, she thought she was dealing with it. Right. But she was dealing with it the wrong way, you know. Well, I, I believe that Carrie Fisher handled hers, you know, especially in the later years, she handled it really well by being so open about it. and using it in jokes and telling real stories yes. with those jokes. It was really yes. effective. And it was kind of nice to see someone with that big of a name being so open about something so yes. personal. Um, one of the things I think that um, affects that is that even when I got diagnosed, I mean, I'd had a period of years before that where everybody was like, what is wrong with him? <laughs> Including myself. Um, but I found that the knowledge that I had about bipolar disorder was completely wrong. And oh. it, took, it took the it took the diagnosis and a really good a really good counselor who I've been seeing this whole time. I've told her she can never move and she can never die. And I call her the Oracle because <laughs> she's helped me on so many things. Um, but knowledge and general education is so poor um, when it comes to this thing. Um, and a lot of people just human nature they don't understand something, so they want to walk away from it or criticize it or whatever, not take the time to understand mm -hmm. it. Well, I don't know if you have uh, discovered this for yourself. I imagine you have because you're very knowledgeable. But Kenny, the, there's so much information available now on the computer. And as much as I loathe the computer, I also appreciate being able to get information uh, on a personal level that I don't have to necessarily run to somebody else and ask about, but can pull up myself. And uh, I'm hoping that anybody that is suffering any kind of mental trauma is looking it up and, and dealing with it and finding a group to share it with. Uh, I, I was such a believer in the, the, the sessions with people coming together at our clinic at the Thalians uh, to, to share, whether they were alcoholics or former druggies or whatever, uh, and sometimes, not just sometimes, quite often bipolar people were part of the group that would just come to share their friggin' experiences so they're not alone in what yeah. they're doing. And, and that when, when you're sharing with somebody, it just makes it so much easier, you know? Sure. Uh, and, and so I, I appreciate anybody that delves into this and does something for themselves. And bravo for you, buddy. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks for sharing your time with us tonight here too. I'm going to I'm Step delighted off. to be with you. <laughs> Thank you. Handsome guy. Oh, I'll send you some money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank and you. He can, he can sing too, by the way. Uh, ah. next... <laughs> Don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> next Thanks. up, we have Mary Jane. Hi, Ruta. I just want to share this with you. I'm from El Paso. Ah, oh, Debbie's from El Paso. And I don't oh. know. You can see this great picture. Yeah. Her. She came and um, 
she we have this lovely theater called the the um plaza theater in el paso and my mother-in-law um saved it from the wrecking ball and oh. uh debbie came for a fundraiser but it was really hard to get her to come because she i if you you know her you knew her she didn't love el paso and <laughs> she talked about being dirt poor they and, were and her home had a dirt floor and that's what it meant and and when she came and she was so beautifully received and lovingly welcomed back um it just really moved me and i had no idea that you were friends with her and i just wanted you to know she 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 really she just um warmed everyone's heart and i think we were able to make her feel loved and appreciated for her roots on that dirt floor in our sweet old El Paso. I live in Seguin now down in central Texas, but uh -huh. Uh -huh. it was very special to meet her and to be able to make her feel special in her hometown. Well, you did something very special for her then because she always in her shows talked about being from El Paso and her daddy was a railroad man. Mm -hmm. And they they truly didn't have a pot and what to pee. You know, it was really amazing. And their little home, when they moved to California, was a very small, nondescript little kind of one of those right after the war built houses, you know, out in the, in the valley, when the valley you almost had to take a train to get to. Mm -hmm. And she always loved and appreciated her roots and that they taught her as did her family, you know, how to live simply and to the best of your ability. And she never forgot to be a generous, loving human being. She so appreciated anything that came her way and she was very willing to share that kind of love and generosity with everybody. And we became very good friends because of the Thalians. She was the one that nominated me for the presidency. Uh, and I mean, our presidents had been uh, Donald O'Connor, Debbie herself, Margaret Whiting, uh, the singer, Hugh O'Brien, you know, talk about Westerns. <laughs> and I thought, what the hell am I doing as, as president? And uh, boy, she knew what she was doing because she wrote me into that. And either she or I remained as president and chairman of the board for 40 years. We switched positions every once in a while. She'd say, I'm going to be home for a while. So I'll be chairman. You be, you know, you be president or whatever the case may be. I miss her. I miss her very, very much. And uh, I'm sorry that we never did work in Texas together. That would have been great fun because that's my adopted state and I'm a resident of Texas. And, uh, and she was, had been a resident of Texas, but her mom and dad were simple folk. Her mom was a bit of a pushy person in that she pushed her to do this and that and and uh she but she sewed the clothes for everybody and she'd come to the thalian meetings and help do things so she was wonderful and yeah. i loved her and i'm so glad that you brought this up because it gives me a chance to just send up a kiss and and a, a loving thought to our beloved debbie mary francis was her real name mary francis reynolds Yes. But uh, the studio decided that Debbie was a better name. That's okay. That's okay. But she did beautiful work, and I've been watching her on TCM. Oh. I watched her recently on How the West Was Won. By God, she should have won an Academy Award for that because she aged, you know, <laughs> 80 years in it. It was just wonderful. Uh, and I'm so proud to have had her as my, my sister more than my friend. Well, I can see why you and she were such close friends. And you, whoever said you need to play Ann Richards, nailed that. 
we need you to play. Yes. We need you to come here and run for governor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll do that. <laughs> Thank you. We'll vote for you. I've always said that in, in Fort Worth, which of course is, is my home away from home or my second home, first to home now, uh, that I could run for mayor without any political campaign and I'd <laughs> You'd win. But I better do it fast. <laughs> Well, it's but, a delight to meet you and thank you for sharing your time. You. And I hope that we get to meet in person and I, I must come to Seguin, which I keep calling Sequin. Uh, <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> like everybody else. I see you've got a marvelous little white dog behind you with That's big Poncho. eyes. <laughs> That's Poncho. <laughs> oh, Poncho, how cute. Yes. How very cute. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. We have a lot of great history down here and a lot of uh, stories need to be told from, from this area. Well, let's do it. But somebody has to write the Ann Richards story for me to play. Have you heard of it? Ah, yes, yes, yes. My mother-in-law oh. wrote this book, True Women. Oh, really? Yes. And my son wrote a play based on another book she wrote called Will's War. And well, tell your son to get busy. I we have been working on him. <laughs> Another long story, but we're here for you. And um, I can't on. tell you how pleased I am that you said hello, that you showed me the picture of Debbie, that you showed me the picture of the book and brought up your mother-in-law's name. And now that darling son, tell him to get busy and write a beautiful light somewhat comedic okay. role for me because Ann Richards had a great sense of humor. Mm -hmm. She did, she was marvelous. You are, I, I mean, I see, I see her in you. I see her. Thank you. That's a great compliment. I thank you very much and happy new year, my friend. God bless. We'll meet in person one of these days. Well, yes, thank you. With about a quarter hour left, unless Ms. Lee is wanting to stay longer, which I know we'd all love, we've got a few more people with questions. And Good. Yes, Good. Uh, we have Katie Dugas, who I will just mention is an amazing graphic artist. Yes. You're all going to see some beautiful changes on our website for Network Austin Mixer and our social media, thanks to the very talented Katie Dugas. And Katie has a question. I do. Um, I have to say, one, you are very, very empowering as a woman. It's very admirable. And I'm sure you get to watch a lot of people and a lot of different generations enjoy what you do on screen, you know, in person. However, what brings you the most joy in seeing that in people? Wow. Um... You know, I appreciate the talents that exist around us. There are some very, very gifted people. I wish I was impressed as well with their philanthropy. I can't say that I see that many people of the current generations that are doing and giving. Oh, there are a lot, but not as many as I grew up admiring and loving and then asking to participate in whatever. You know, it was it was a, a different time when I could pick up the phone and call and, and get through to somebody for, for Dean Martin or Angela Lansbury, whom I hit when I was doing Murder, She Wrote, to, to come and do something for the Thalians. And, and, you know, to this day, it would be easier if I could get through directly to, to people, but I don't know that new generation of stars. And what I do know is that I'm not seeing that they're as giving or eager to participate in, in helping. That's a very generalized statement that I'm making because there are wonderful people out there. But oh my God, there's a lot of talent. Oh, There is. 
What so what is, is your advice to our generation to get them, you know, back in, I hate to say the old school mindset, but, you know, to go back school. to the good old days. It is old school because as I said earlier, I think it came from vaudeville and maybe from way before that, I don't know. But I know vaudevillians were always ready to appear at any benefit to benefit somebody or something that needed help. And as, a, as Americans, we are, we are geared that way to help if we know the story. The problem is that our young people now are so surrounded by a protective layer of people that don't make 10% of a no money deal, that don't make anything for the PR that they're doing, you know, if that star isn't bringing in the bucks. And so it's a little more difficult in that way. And so my, my advice would be to anybody that is hearing my voice that is on their way up and hopefully everybody's on their way up so that they're not wasting their money on their tap dancing lessons and their singing lessons and their, uh, you know, acting lessons and their direction lessons, whatever, that they think beyond what I need for me and open themselves up a little more to the humanity that they should be showing. Uh, it's very easy to say and tougher to do when you are guided by all kinds of people that don't want this. I mean, nowadays, Barry will be the first to tell you, you hire publicity people to keep the press away from you rather than get me press, get me the, the writers, get me the publicists that, that want uh, to see me, get, uh, get me whatever, you know, get me on a television show get me on Johnny Carson's, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, they, they are being protected from that. Um, and I hope that somebody doesn't get pissed at me for saying that, but it, it's the truth. Uh, listen and watch and see how many people you can get to. Now, look, I know uh, Cher because I've known her through the years all around. If I can get to Cher, Cher will come and do something. But the problem is to get to her. And that changes, I swear, every 20 days, you know, phone numbers are different. Uh, the, the people involved in their lives are different. Um, it, it's tough. It's tough to, I'm still looking for people to replace me and, and my now gone Debbie uh, in big positions at the uh, Thalians. We haven't been doing our big events now because of COVID. So we're doing smaller events and we just had one at uh, the Waldorf Astoria here in Los Angeles and it was a beautiful event, uh, but it's not the big shows we used to do. And uh, I need somebody to replace myself and to replace our, our now president, Dr. Lehrhoff, that have showbiz experience because you need people with entree, you need somebody in the business, whether it was myself or Debbie, going out there and saying, uh, uh, I need to talk uh, to share, or I, I need to talk to whoever the hot singer is that you need to get for the show. Um, it's hard to get to them. And I don't know what else to do except say, come on, wake up people, open yourselves up a little more. Well, thank you for being you and thank you for just being inspiring in general. Well, you're very kind and you're another pretty bitch <laughs> oh, well, with dark thank hair. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't you. have the blonde going. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Thank you, dear. And you have another one coming up. And that would be, oh, wait. Yes, Sherry. Sherry? Hey, hey uh, Rhoda. Can yeah, you hear me? Okay. I'm looking at Barry, but I'm talking to Sherry, I guess. Right. Yeah, I am a little under the weather tonight, so I didn't put, want to put my picture up there, uh, the oh. video, because, yeah, w my husband and myself, we, we're hoping it's not COVID. Uh, oh, started, please, yeah, Lord. And we're vaccinated and all that, but, you know, it's going around. You'll and, get it, yes. I yeah. know my keeper got it, 
vaccinated, yeah. boosted, everything else, and got it. And thank God, even though we were all around her over the holiday weekend, <laughs> nobody got it. Thank you. Right. Yeah. So we don't know. So I just didn't want well, to Well, Sherry, picture. feel better. Oh, yeah. We're going to be fine. We're going to be good. But you Pour look yourself. amazing. You are Sherry? absolutely beautiful. You look amazing. Oh, anyway. my God. Thank you. I didn't <laughs> put a big face on today because I was so oh. frantically busy with phone calls. Um, no, you're gorgeous. And, and Bless you. Thank no, you. And, and like Katie said, you are an empowering woman. You are just amazing. I can't wait to read your book. And um, uh, you touched on the mental health stuff. I was raised by a mother that was bipolar. Oh, and, boy. Mm -hmm, and, like, and like you said, um, she had her first quote unquote nervous breakdown when I was seven. Oh, because, my Lord. Right. They, they called it a nervous breakdown because they didn't know yeah. at that time. Right. Yeah. Um, I think I was 12 before she was finally diagnosed. Uh, as being bipolar and of course or manic depressive they called it and yes. put her on lithium and the whole nine yards yes. and stuff but um it was it was a difficult life growing up with a mother you know um and how long did she live uh, my mom died when she was 58 oh boy that's young well she had C she she had copd when she died oh, oh. yeah and i'm 58 well you had your hands <laughs> full didn't you oh Girl. i did up with a wacky mother <laughs> so wacky and and yeah. then you know, oh my lord child yeah a little bit my dad died when he was 54 he had a massive heart attack so i have outlived both of my parents at this point but um and right now i'm raising my grandchildren i have a six and 11 year old that we have custody of so anyway that that was you my have really <laughs> gotten the wrong end of the stick needless <laughs> Hey, but, it's okay. but I'm sure that those children will grow up fine, wonderful people because you give a damn and you'll take Thank care you. of them. And in some ways, they will be more than a blessing to you. They will, you're, you're going to have to take care of them. So you have to take care of yourself to provide the love and attention that they need. Yes, ma'am. We do. We, I'm from Alabama. Anyway, and a good friend of mine, uh, Betsy Missoula, um, she's friends with um, somebody that you know, and she oh. said, she said, get on Zoom tonight, Ruta Lee's on there, and she knew that I liked you and everything, so anyway, my question was, I had just watched <clears throat> the episode of Andy Griffith, my favorite show of all time, uh, where you were the college girl. The oh, yeah. Yes, one of my favorite episodes. I was just wondering, and please don't tell me he was an ass, because I've heard that oh, he was. Because <laughs> I, I will tell you that he was one of the most delightful people I have ever known in my life. And it was such a pleasure to do that show. I did it several times. And it was hysterical laughter at all times. He would play that guitar and carry on and sing body songs. And, uh, you know, then you'd have to do something straight and carry on. What a fine man. And, of course, the, the whole company was wonderful. And, and as I wrote in my book, I should have paid a hell of a lot more attention to Ronnie. Because uh -huh. look who he grew up to be. Right. Son of a bitch hasn't cast me in anything. <laughs> Damn, we gotta call him. <laughs> no, I just, I just had just recently watched it because it's my feel good show. If if I want to get happy, I just, I just put Andy Griffith on and watch it, and because him and Don Knotts. So I just wondered what it was like working with them. I'm, I'm sure I you love them both. I just love them <laughs> both, and and loved every minute with them. And I, I have been invited and have not quite gotten the times organized to go up to. Mount Ivy or wherever the hell it is and yeah. do the the yearly gathering that they have for the show. Um, I, I had the great pleasure of being invited to uh, Jamestown, New York, which is the home of Lucille Ball. Yes. They have a great big, huge festival. Uh, I suppose it's somewhat like the gathering, you know, for Andy uh, every year. 
And uh, it was such fun to be there and to visit and swap stories. And they, they screened a couple of the shows that I did with, with Lucy and wow, what a treat that was. So I would imagine that anything up uh, there will be wonderful fun too. And I know that Ronnie Shell, who is a good friend of mine, is very involved with the event every year and he has asked me to come up. So who knows, maybe this year, but who knows with this bloody coat, what's going to happen? Yeah, yeah, Ronnie Shell, I think he did. Uh, did he do something on with uh, um, Gomer Pyle? The, um... Gomer Pyle, he was on Gomer Pyle. Right, that's what yeah. I thought. Okay, which was yeah, a spinoff. I of of those too, yeah. Yeah. And my best girlfriend played Miss Bunny on Gomer Pyle. Oh, okay. Barbara Stewart. And yeah. uh, and she was my long, long, long time, very dear girlfriend. Uh, oh. So uh, that that's all part of my my history, and I feel like it's more than history, honey. I feel like it's family, you know. Yeah. Well, you have an amazing legacy. Thank you so much for doing this tonight. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you. Yes, ma'am. God bless, Sherry. Since we can't see a picture of you, could you tell us your last name? Uh, yes, it's Bradford. Okay. Right. Bradford. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And next up, we have Jeff. Hi, Miss Lee. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. I could. Uh... Who the hell is Miss Lee? Sorry, Ruta. I, I just appreciate you coming out so much. Um, I'm just kind of an old school Hollywood guy, so I promise I could lock you in a room for two weeks and never run out of questions for you. So I'll try and keep this as brief as I can. And I promise not to lock you in a room ever if we get to meet. But uh, Oh, I don't know. If it's with you, I don't mind. <laughs> oh, there we go. So I'm a single girl now. <laughs> It's like, there's a, a couple of things I just wanted to hit really fast because I'll try and keep this quick. I know we're running out of time, but um, number one, um, in the last seven years of her life, I, I, I met Carrie Fisher and got to know her quite well. And it was one of those nights we, we met at an event and just some reason we clicked and became friends to the point that she exchanged her contact information with me and and we stayed in touch. And she Good. came to Houston when she was doing her her uh, one woman show and she said- Wasn't it great? She sent me three front row tickets for me and my wife and my mother, who's the biggest uh, Debbie Reynolds fan on the planet. So I got to take my mom and take her backstage and, and, and introduce her to Carrie. And then, but we're, we are so front row that literally at the edge of the stage was our nose was sitting on the edge. <laughs> and as you probably remember, about two minutes in, uh, Carrie takes her shoes off and she walks around barefooted the whole show. And yeah. all I remember is just seeing Carrie's feet going back and forth, her bare feet. <laughs> Up there, but um, she was such a sweetheart, and I do I miss I miss talking to Carrie. I'm sure not nearly as much as you miss talking to Debbie, but um, that's just a very special memory of mine. But there's somebody that you I'm dying to know if you know my friend. I be, I I befriended a gentleman in about 2007. Uh, he's from Wichita Falls, Texas, and he was a big singer. He was also a professional golfer, and he was very good friends with Dean Martin and and Bing and all the guys. His name was Don Cherry, and Don was a singer and a golfer. Oh, I remember that name very well. Yeah. He but was, I don't, I didn't ever meet no, him I, that I can recall. I think I, I was curious. Remember. He hosted Dean's summer show a lot and did a lot of things like that. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. I'm so sorry that I didn't get to know him, but uh, I, I am so delighted that you got to see her one woman show, meaning yeah. Carrie. That's all about uh, five times. <laughs> yes. And I saw it with Debbie in the audience. We sat oh, together. Wow. And that was kind of an amazing thing I to bet. have, have uh, Debbie, who really gets made a little fun of. Well, yeah, she, she's very frank about her childhood in the, in the show. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and uh, but I, I loved that Debbie adored her daughter. And, you know, there were a lot of years went by when they were not at all even speaking, right. never mind close. Yeah. And I'm so pleased that at the end of her life, uh, you know, that they were, she was coming home very for close. Christmas to be with her mother, which is really very special. You know, something very interesting happened. I don't know if you all know George Pinocchio. He's the red carpet man for ABC television here okay. in Hollywood. And he's like a kid of ours. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure you know Bobby Wygant, who is, the NBC voice for the last, what, 70 years. Yeah. Uh, and, and she loves, loves George Pinocchio and his wife and introduced them to me. And they have become like my kids now as well. 
And they were in Mexico with me and I did not know that Debbie had died. I wasn't turning on the news and it wasn't flashing, you know, right there. If it was, I wasn't seeing it. And they, George and, and my, my godson uh, said, you know, we're gonna have to tell her. We were all down on the Embarcadero at a restaurant having dinner outside in beautiful area. And they took me aside and said, Debbie, that Debbie had passed and, you know, that Carrie had and now Debbie had. And can I say a few words for George for ABC television? Mm -hmm. And I was dumbstruck, needless to say, that this had happened. And I thought, I, I, I don't know that I'm going to be able to get a word out. And I don't know whether it was Debbie's hand reaching out and tapping me on the shoulder and saying, do it, girl. But not only did I get out what I thought was going to be 30 seconds worth, we did a full half hour, wow. which was the most important television stuff that ABC had done. And it was the first. And it was just amazing. And, and it just goes to show you, like you, you know, that you, you can live through almost anything if you're doing it with love and for the love of somebody else. And that, that proved a point to me. And I've always appreciated George saying, you've got to do this. We've got to do a little something about Debbie and only you can do it. So it was a moment to remember and I'm sure we can pull up the tape somewhere and pull it out, but uh, a sweet memory. So I'm so glad that uh, you're remembering Carrie in that delicious way. Oh, always, always. And, and the only other thing is I wanted to mention is you, know, you talk about the charitable stuff. And, uh, you know, I moved to L.A. when I was 19 for a show I was doing and didn't know anybody. And that's how I kind of fell into the old school, became a fan of the old school stuff, because I fell in with an old older crowd that just was was kind of from that era. And but years later, in, in the late 90s, um, uh, we were doing a bunch of charity work and we started doing some, some work with uh, 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 Justin Timberlake and, and got to know him fairly well. And when JT took over uh, the Bob Hope Desert Classic out in Palm Springs, uh, I was actually talking to him, having this exact same conversation that we're just having about why we can't get the younger people to be more yeah. philanthropic. And I asked him how, why he got involved with this thing. And he says, because Bob Hope got his hands on him when he was young. And, ah. and there. And, and but but JT is is very he'll if you can get a, again if you can get to him if you can get a hold of him and uh, you know I can't even get a hold of him anymore uh, if you can get a hold of him he'll do almost anything you ask him to do if he's got if if he's free to do it and uh, but he's got a philanthropic heart he's a great guy and, uh, and, and thank you that is a lovely a lovely idea you gave me now look if I could get through to friggin Khrushchev surely I can get through <laughs> it's a GT, to Justin yeah. <laughs> Timberlake I've got to find out where he lives and go sit on his porch or something and bring him a glass go. of wine and talk him into yeah. just being the front man he doesn't have to do very yeah, much no, just show up yeah just show up exactly yeah. oh my I know he has a house in the hills I just don't know how much time he spends there but I know he's got a house up there but I don't know where else he is but this is well if, if you have a picture of the house send it to me <laughs> And I'll look it up on the computer or have Judy go. look it up and we'll find <laughs> it. That's a great idea, honey. Thank you. I'll reach out to some people and see if I can. Okay. Okay. Well. God love you. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing our show. Love you. Well, Satori okay. next. Satori, and Satori is a name I recognize because of Barry. You are now oh. up. Hello. Hi, Ruta. Look at that gorgeous creature. <laughs> How are you doing? Uh, let me just say that Satori has been up to the house before. Uh, she's, she's, she's been up to, up to the house as we were working on the book and uh, visited with us. I think it was like six years ago, seven. Oh, God. <laughs> yes. Something like that. Yeah. I have a beautiful well, photo with Ruta. You're still gorgeous. Thank you. <laughs> It's an honor coming from you. I, you know, I would love to understand, maybe if you could share from your perspective, I had had the pleasure 
of knowing Donald O'Connor, Debbie Reynolds, um, uh, Leo Jaffe, so many people, Loretta Young, and all because I lived in Palm Springs and they were all amazing. And I would hear the most um, prolific stories of how, uh, you know, Hollywood, in my opinion, <laughs> the best part of Hollywood was when they were, you know, uh, filming their movies like Singing in the Rain or um, all of them. I got to hear all these amazing stories. And I, I would love to hear from your perspective, uh, maybe some of your favorite moments that you could think of and maybe some of the most challenging roles and what made it challenging and what helped you to be able to kind of push through it and to be able to make the performances that you did. That's a very interesting and a, a rather deep question because I, I don't know that I ever found roles difficult well, they're difficult, but not that challenging that I didn't have the wherewithal, the stamina, the, the, the guts to, to pull it off. Um, sometimes there have been a, some things I've done on stage that were exceedingly difficult. And you, you difficult in that they were tear bound and, you know, all of that sort of stuff that goes on and difficult to control because when you get into a teary scene, as you may or may not know, uh, it, it's hard to balance it. It's one thing for the stage. It's one thing when you're doing it on camera. Uh, when you're doing it on camera, you have to control it because let's face it, if it's a teary scene, a very un unattractive nose running you know, will occur. Uh, I found things like that difficult to control physically uh, while I was playing something emotionally. Uh, uh, I don't know what saw me through it. What saw me through it was preparation, uh, energy, and throwing myself into it. And of course, it always helped when you got a pat on the back saying, nice job, or you hear applause which is music to every performer's ears. Uh, and when you're working with people that appreciate the trouble that you're in trying to get something done and help you rather than hinder you along the way, um, it's, it's again, it's a matter of generosity and not necessarily just doing for somebody else, but you are doing for somebody else. But the generosity of a good actor playing with you and helping you makes all the difference in the world. If you have to do it on your own, it's tough. There are wonderful actors who insist on being there for your close-up on a major scene because they want you to look in their eyes and so that they can help you rather than just having someone sit with the script and read the lines and you have to portray the same emotions to this person as you do to a post that's standing there. You know, that happens sometimes too. The, the lighting and it requires that you look at something other than the person you're dealing with. Uh, it's not an easy business. I don't think people that are not in the film or television industry realize how difficult it is to repeat the same scene a thousand times, once for the long shot, once for the medium shot, once for the close-up, another one from another angle for the close-up, once from another angle for the long shot, and to repeat the same words with the same depth and pick up the same things you're dealing with and do the same hand gestures and do the same head turn for each setup, nobody realizes that's what takes to do movies. You don't just come on and go, wee, and I'm over, you know. Uh, so I think I hit part of what you asked me. 
Now I don't remember what else you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Thank you. I, you know, if it's possible, I'd love to just ask you one more. Sure. Um, well, I could pick your brain for hours, as I'm sure, as Jeff said. <laughs> um, so for screen chemistry, can you share with us maybe some of your favorite moments and what it takes for an actor to be able to get into the moment? Maybe even sometimes when you haven't had the pleasure of getting to know the actor that you're going to have a scene with. Well, yeah, I think the most difficult is to climb into bed with somebody that you don't know. Uh, it can be the most fun, too, if you have a sense of humor. Uh, but, uh, gosh, getting into something takes a little effort. I, I uh, have always been fairly blessed that I don't need to be off by myself in a corner, not hearing or not seeing anything to get in the right mood for what you're doing, because you get into the right mood and it's the long shot. Then you have to get into the mood again for the medium shot. You know, then you have to get in the mood again for the close up. And by the time you're at the close up, you're at the tail end of your energy and at the tail end of, of what you have to give to the camera and to give to the scene. So it's, it's you, you have to ration your delivery. You have to ration it and learn to do it ass backwards. Usually it's the long shot that you do first. And the long shot is where you should just barely do the scene, just almost mark it, because they're not gonna use that except an establishing shot. Then on the medium shot, maybe you give it a little more. And then on the close up is when you give it the full gusto that you have. And hopefully, if it's too much, the director will say, let's do that a little easier, a little softer, if you have a good director. Wow, wow that's amazing. Thank you, Ruta. Never thought about it like Thank that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ruta, no, I really I, think we're running over just a little bit. I think we had just, sure. uh, are you okay? Just two more quick. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Quick questions. Okay. Uh, would TJ, TJ? TJ. You had a second question, and yes. then last, and then last we have Tootie, but with Barry as proxy. So go ahead, TJ. So you know, I just wanted to say I was listening to everything, and you know, my my name is actually Tammy, and I was my mother names me after Debbie Reynolds. Debbie, of course. <laughs> So when you were talking, I found that interesting. She used to sing me uh, Tammy's in Love yes. when I was little. Um, and, you know, I think that just goes to show you, my mother was born in 1928. Um, I was, um, she called me her change of life baby. Uh -huh. She was 43 and my dad was 63 when I was born. Um, but I think it just goes to show that, how characters and that the actors portray just have such a real impact in the real world, you know, on people. And, and, you know, that being said, my question is, you know, when you were coming up, of course, I'm not an actress by any means, shape or form. I was an agent for many years. Oh. Um, uh, my question is what movie ca character or, actor actress um had an impact on you when you were starting out in the business wow <laughs> i i think that probably directors had more impact mm -hmm. i appreciated right from the beginning that a director can do you great justice or great harm. Mm -hmm. The editor of the film that you're doing is truly God because your performance can be heightened or lessened by the cutting of whatever it is. So the director and editor, and when it's one and the same, you're really blessed. Uh, that's that's who makes a difference. Uh, 
actors who care enough about you to respond and work well with you and maybe take a few minutes aside from the set to work it out, you know, to try something are wonderful. Um, I always admired the people that didn't need somebody there to do this. Um, oh God, I'm doing a blank on his name now. Jake and the Fat Man. Um, Bill. William Ooh. Conrad. Yeah. Thank you, William Conrad. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Never needed anybody. I was always willing to take time when I was working with him to do whatever it was that needed to be done. And he said, no, go, go have a drink, go do something. And he was very proficient at just looking at a spot on the wall. And it could be me with my big lashes, or it could be, uh, you know, Mamie Van Doren with her big boobs, or it could be anybody. And he could picture it all. So I admired him, uh, but I sure loved it when somebody was nice enough to hang in and do whatever had to be done, no matter how much time it was taking. Thank you so much. You, you're Thank just you so much. I, I just so enjoyed listening to your stories and and just what an amazing woman you are. Thank you. Are you are you still agenting, TJ? I'm not. I'm trying to be retired. Oh, but... don't retire. <laughs> there are too many kids out there that need your help. Well, I I tell you, I'm um I, I, you know I was an agent for years and a casting director, and I say I'm trying to be retired, but see, look at me still you know, hanging in with the film industry. <laughs> well, find something for me to do, for God's sake. Don't just right. sit there, my darling ass. Do we, it. We've got to get Ruta, Ruta back on set, for sure. Ruta, we got one more quick question. Uh, sure. Judy has been kind enough. She's running all of this from behind the scenes tonight. She was too harsh to speak for herself, uh, but she wanted to know what Sammy Davis Jr. was like in real life. Sammy Davis was one of my dearest and most beloved friends. He was the kind of person that made life so easy for everybody. And you know what I really loved about him? That he was never concerned about politically correct and all that plain old bullshit that we're all living through now. And we're afraid to laugh at anything. We're afraid to kid each other. We're afraid to point out our ethnic, you know, culpabilities and things. Why? Because it's politically correct to, to, to ignore it all. Come on. He was fabulous. And it was his responsibility when we were doing Sergeants 3 and on location in Kanab, Utah and other places, it was his responsibility to walk me home because the boys would party and there would be ladies coming up from Las Vegas and whatnot to, to make fun with the boys and all of that. And Frank would say, all right, it's time for Ruta to go to bed. And Sammy would walk me back to the room. And Sammy was just the dearest, loveliest friend. And I remained good friends after he died with his wife. And uh, we used to see each other. And then, you know, things change. You, you, have a new set of friends and people and whatnot, but I will always remember Sammy Davis. And the thing that really pissed me off was that as tiny as I am, Sammy was tinier and he could wear my gun belt. <laughs> and he was very good at fast draw and twirling guns and all of that. He loved Western stuff. So we shared a, a lot in common there because a wonderful uh, uh, gun belt maker and costume designer, Arvo Oyala, made a beautiful gun belt for me with my name all, and not embroidered, but carved out of it. And Sammy used to be able to wear my gun belt. Wow, wow. You've been so generous uh, with your time tonight. I told you that no more than 90 minutes, we're gonna be, it's gonna be, and here we are. So thank you. Uh, for just I thank uh, you because you put this together you introduced me to some lovely new friends and and I feel that I'll I'll be like we need to exchange contact numbers I'll leave it up to you to worry about that so that uh Debbie's daughter Carrie isn't the only one that exchanged numbers with that cute guy and <laughs> I don't blame her even though he watched her feet walking by through the whole show 
Um, anyway, do do share my my contact, my email, whatever. Okay. Right. And I look forward to seeing everybody. And please, 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 if you don't have the book, do go out and buy it. Go buy this book. And consider the title very seriously meant for each and every one of you. Consider your ass kissed. <laughs> thank what you. a wonderful thought to leave us with. And thank you so much, Ruta. This, this has been a great joy and a pleasure. And I'm very grateful to Barry and Tudy and Gary. Gary is one of our founding members of Network Austin Mixer. And Barry and Tudy are amazing at how much they do to keep it continuing for our entertainment community. Thank you so much, Ruta, for coming. Thank this you, and wonderful. may God keep smiling on all of you, and certainly please, God, keep smiling on America. Yes. Amen. God bless. We love you. Love yes. you. All right. Bye. Good night, Thank Carly. you, Ruta. Thank you so much. You are all so welcome. See you soon, I hope.